I was laying in bed one day, and I was thinking about something. Actually, I was thinking of a lot of things, but only one is relevant to what I'm talking about. The new Pokemon games that were coming out later that week. This got me thinking about a lot of things, such as how I want to play, what new Pokemon have been shown that I want to use, which version to play, but one of those on my mind was the Pokedex, on whether I will complete it or not. I decided not, the Pokedex is a big time sink that I didn't want to do at that moment, but I went ahead and did it anyway. Thing is, this was only the second time in my life that I've ever completed a Pokedex, the other time being the Black 2 Regional decks. That didn't feel right to me. I loved these games, but I basically just threw the main story and a little bit of post-game. I am a completionist when I play games. I generally don't stop a game until I collect everything in the game, or at the very least get bored and do something else. I always make at least an attempt. The Pokedexes in a lot of Pokemon games have a lot of thought and care in designing the methods and strategies to catch Pokemon and make it a completionist goal. It's clear to me that the Pokedex is an important completion goal that they want players to be able to achieve, especially as the slogan of the franchise is gotta catch them all. What if I went back through and did them all, just for fun? Which is the easiest to complete? Which is the hardest? Which ones are the most painful to do? Which ones take the most amount of time? Which ones are the most enjoyable? And that brings me to a massive investment of time that I'll likely spend the next few years of my life doing. I was going to complete the Pokedex in every generation of Pokemon games, determining how long each takes and answering all those questions. Of course, Gen 1 was going to be the first game, but before we get into the actual playthrough, we need to establish rules, which version I'll be playing and what I'll be playing on. Rule 1 is pretty simple. The Pokedex must be in a state where I can get the certificate at the Game Freak office for completing it. This means every Pokemon other than Mew must be caught. Rule 2 is that glitches are only allowed if it makes it possible to obtain otherwise impossible Pokemon. Doing the infamous Mew glitch to get, well, Mew? That's allowed. Doing the missing no glitch for rare candies? Not allowed. Doing whatever the hell Gen 1 catch all speedruns are doing? Also not allowed. I mean, seriously, what the hell is going on here? Rule 3 is that any outside resource is allowed. Twitch chat? Check. Bulbapedia? Check. Speedrun notes to get through the games quickly? Check. But I'm also going to do at least one regular playthrough of each set of games, because I haven't played a lot of them since before Sword and Shield released. Rule 4 is that every game must start from a completely blank, fresh save. This series is meant to be a way to judge what it takes to complete the Pokedex from scratch. So maybe you just bought the Gen 1 games, getting ready to complete them for the first time. Maybe you completed the Pokedex in a more recent game, so you want to go give it a shot in these games. So the idea of just bringing like 50 Pokemon over from previously completed games is kind of cheating. This point doesn't matter too much in Generation 1, but when we get to the later generation of those games, this one will become much more important. With those rules established, which version will I use? I decided to do Pokemon Yellow for a few reasons. Number one is that it's the definitive Gen 1 experience, and these were going to act as casual playthroughs as I hadn't played some of these games in years. Reason two is that otherwise, Yellow would not be required, and I wanted to include all of the games. Reason three is that it eliminates any need for a reset on any of the games. I can use one save throughout each game. The final reason is that it's the game where you can get the most amount of Pokemon with just one cartridge being 129 compared to the 124 of Red and Blue. As for what I'll be playing on, I'll be using the Visual Boy Advanced emulator to be able to actually record these games. One final thing is that I have laid out this video sort of like a guide, saying what Pokemon I caught in each route so that if you want, you could follow along as well if you so choose. Along with this, I have a Google document linked in the description which also lays out what new Pokemon can be caught in each area of the game that you could follow along with if you want. I likely won't do this kind of narration for every Pokemon I catch for every game. Eventually there will just be too many Pokemon to name out like that, and there's also later games that just have much more factors that need to be discussed. As Generation 1 only has 151 Pokemon, and it's pretty simple in terms of the methods of getting Pokemon, I feel like I can at least just do it here. Otherwise this video would be 5 minutes where I just say, I caught this many Pokemon in the wild, I then evolved them all to get 129 Pokemon in the decks, then I started playthroughs of Red and Blue to get those last Pokemon, which would be boring. Okay, with all of that out of the way, let's get to the actual playthroughs of these games. Okay, this is a little off script, but I just need to make this point here. When I was doing this playthrough, right as I was finishing up the playthrough, I accidentally deleted, like, a quarter of my footage. The first quarter, the first ten hours, so... Everything from the start of Yellow all the way up to entering Fuchsia, 
I had to re-record. This means that the narration probably isn't going to be 100% accurate to what you see in this video. I apologize. I, I fucked up. Always make sure to back up your data. Anyway, let's get started. I started up yellow and named myself and my rifle, got my first Pokemon Pikachu, and went through the game normally up until after getting my Pokedex. Once I did, I stocked up on balls and went west to Route 22, where I caught a Rattata, or two actually, I forgot I caught one already because the Pokemon that you have caught don't have the ball next to their name in this generation, a Spearow, a Mankey, which yes, can be found here in yellow, and both the Nidorans. I actually ran out of Pokeballs catching the male one, and I didn't have enough money to buy more, so I had to sell my potions to buy the balls. I specifically did that with this Pokemon, as I wanted to use Nidoking on my team. If it was any of the others, I would have come back later. I destroyed Blue again and went into the Viridian Forest, where I immediately ran out of Pokeballs again. Apparently, Pokemon are just hard to catch in this generation compared to others. Probably a bug. It's Gen 1 after all. I went through the forest as normal, fighting all the trainers for experience, and destroyed Brock with double kicks. With that, I got my first badge and a whole lot of money. I used all of this money on more Pokeballs, then went back to the Verdian Forest to catch a Caterpie, Metapod, and Pidgey. You actually cannot get the Weedle line in yellow, so I'll need to trade them over from red later on. I went to Route 3 and battled the trainers on my way to Mount Moon, and I also caught a Sandshrew here. In Mount Moon, I caught a Zubat, Geodude, Paris, and eventually a Clefairy. I also picked up the Moonstones here and here. My Nidoran evolved into a Nidorino, and I used a Moonstone to evolve it into Nidoking. I also picked up the Helix Fossil while I was here. It is impossible to get both Fossil Pokemon in one place, so I'll need to get the Dome Fossil in either red or blue. There's also a fight with Jesse and James here that I completely forgot about. After reaching Cerulean City, I fought Blue, went through Nugget Bridge, tried joining the Mafia, but the game wouldn't let me. Then I was careful not to fight this guy. Keep that in mind for later. I caught an Oddish, Bellsprout, and Venonat in the grass, as well as obtaining the gift Charmander from this guy and the gift Bulbasaur from this girl in his house. I went through Route 24 like normal, fighting all the trainers except for this guy. Remember this piece of info as well. I got to Bill, unfurried him, and got the SS and ticket from him. I also apparently refused the offer to see the rare Pokemon, but I kinda wanted that as my Pokedex needs filling. I then went and fought Misty, piece of cake with Pikachu and Bulbasaur. After fighting Misty, Bulbasaur evolved into Ivysaur. The next thing on the agenda was fighting this Mafia guy who stole the Dig TM. I got it back and never returned it. Apparently Nidoking can't learn Dig, so Charmander learned it instead. I went down to Route 5 and caught both a Jigglypuff and an Abra. It was here that I did one of the most well-known glitches in this game the Mew glitch, or trying to fly if you want to be more technical. I saved right here and as I moved down, I opened my menu. Choosing teleport allowed the trainer to spot me, but I teleported back to Cerulean. I then go and fight this guy who has a Slowpoke. This Slowpoke has a special stat of 21, which is the same as Mew's index number in the game. I beat him, teleport back to Cerulean, go on Nugget Bridge, and what do you know, there's a Mew. I catch Mew and this is the only glitch allowed in this run. It's also worth noting that Charmander evolved after the fight with the Slowpoke. I also used the extra Moonstone to evolve Clefairy into Clefable. I went right down to Vermilion, where I first got the Bike Voucher, and then it went on the SSN, fought all the trainers for experience, fought Blue, and got cut. I taught it to a useless Pokemon and used that to get into Lieutenant Surge's gym, where I destroyed him with two digs. Beating Surge is the requirement to get Squirtle from Officer Jenny, so I got him. I went to Diglett's cave where I caught both Diglett and Dugtrio, which I wasn't expecting as there were only a 5% encounter. I then went out on the other end, went back the way I came because I forgot my cut user, went back again and got flashed by this dude. I also got a Moonstone in this area. On Route 11, just west of the cave, I caught a Drowsy and a Pidgeotto. What? So it turns out in the Generation 1 and 2 games, the PC box doesn't change automatically. If your box is full, you can't catch Pokemon. You have to go back and manually change it once it's full, which gets pretty annoying. I then fight some trainers and reach Rock Tunnel. In Rock Tunnel, I caught a Machop and an Onix, both on the basement floor as they were more common down there. I completely ignored Lavender Town for now and went over to Celadon. I got the gift Eevee at the top of the Celadon condominiums, and this is the only Eevee you get in the game. And there are three evolutions, so you need to trade an Eevee over from all three versions in order to get each evolution. After doing this, I went back to Route 8 and caught a Kadabra. I also proceeded to give a fresh water to the guard to gain access to Saffron, just to get it done and out of the way. Back over in Celadon, I took on the fourth gym leader, Erika. The fight wasn't too bad, though it was the second hardest fight so far in the playthrough. What was the hardest so far? It was this trainer in that very gym. Her Pokemon were Bellsprout. Shouldn't be that tricky, right? Just Ember them to death or Ice Beam if needed. Well, no. This trainer has the most annoying moveset combo I have ever seen. 
Her only moves were Poison Powder, Stun Spore, and Wrap. She would start with a Stun Spore to paralyze me, which also cuts my speed, so she'll always attack first. She then proceeds to spam Wrap over and over, preventing me from being able to damage her. Once the Wrap is over, she just uses it again, and I never get a chance to attack. I had to get lucky and have my Pokemon get poisoned over Paralyzed to actually get out of this fight, and it was very annoying. Next up was taking on the Mafia in the game corner, and apparently the game expected me to do this before Erica. Oops. The Mafia hideout was no issue at all, though it's worth noting that I got both the Blue Stone and the TM for Horn Drill, which I immediately taught to Nidoking. For those who don't know, X accuracy in this game is incredibly powerful. Instead of increasing your accuracy, it makes you 100% accurate on all attacks. Couple that with a move that is a one-hit KO just with normally low accuracy, and you have the ultimate winning strategy for any fight, provided you're a higher level and have enough PP on the move to last a fight. With Giovanni defeated, I got the Silphscope, took a detour to the HM Fly, and went back to Lavender Town. Lavender Town was simple, all I had to do was catch a Gasly and a Haunter. I put the Marowak to rest, got the Poke Flute, and woke the Snorlax on Route 12. I caught the Snorlax, then I got the Super Rod in the Fishing Guru house on this route. From here, I could simply fish up a Horsey and a Seedra, then run around in the grass for a Weeping Bell, which I initially planned to get later at a higher encounter rate, then I got Farfetch'd. I headed right over to Fuchsia City, spent about 8 years looking for the Fishing Guru's brother, finally finding him and getting the Good Rod. It's kinda weird that you get the Super Rod before the Good Rod in this game. Using this, I caught a Golding and a Poliwag in his backyard, followed by Magikarp and Gyarados with the Super Rod. How did a Gyarados fit in that little pond though? I went back to Celadon and went down Cycling Road, but before I did, I caught a Doduo in the grass near the Snorlax. I went on Cycling Road, battling the trainers there as I went down, and my Ivysaur evolved into a Venusaur. I caught a Ponyta while there, as well as a Fero. I then went fishing to catch a Shelter. Damn it. I went down Cycling Road again, and I barely defeated Koga's Gym. You see, in this game, you could do Koga, Sabrina, and Blaine in almost any order. Red and Blue, I believe, leveled the Pokémon as the thought that you would do a particular order, but here, they all have their Pokémon in the high 40s and low 50s in terms of levels, which made them a bit scarier than I liked. I still managed to win and get the Soul Badge. Anyone else find it weird that the Soul Badge is for being the Poison Leader and the Marsh Badge is for the Psychic Leader? Charmeleon also evolved into Charizard in the gym. Oh, oh boy, we're finally here in the video. You know it. You love it. The Safari Zone. There are a ton of Pokémon in the Safari Zone that we need, and they had to make it the most annoying process in intentional and unintentional ways, such as the way of Gen 1. In the first area of the Safari Zone, I caught a Parasect, failed a Tangela, caught a Rhyhorn, got Tangela, and started fishing for two Pokémon, Dratini and Dragonair. In these games, this is the only place where you could catch either of these Pokémon, and they suck to catch. For one, it takes a while to find them because the encounter rates is sometimes not getting a bite on your rod. Not only that, but Dratini and Dragonair have a catch rate of 45. Uh, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. In Pokémon Yellow and Pokémon Yellow only, Dragonair has a catch rate of 27. They did up the catch rate back to 45 for the future, but why the fuck did they do this in the first place? Not only that, but Safari Balls work identically to Ultra Balls, and as it turns out, Ultra Balls are terrible at catching Pokémon at full HP, because Gen 1 are flawless games. Guess how much HP and Pokémon in the Safari Zone have? This alone took me over 35 minutes to catch these two. And that's not the fucking end of this shit. I continued and caught an Execute, two Cubone, a Marowak, which made one of the Cubones completely pointless, a Nidorina, a Tauros, and a Kangaskhan, who is actually pretty common in yellow compared to red and blue. Now here come the two worst Pokémon that we have to catch here, Scyther and Pinsir. Oh, what about Chansey, I hear you ask? And to that I say we can get that in Cerulean Cave without the Safari Zone bullshit. Scyther and Pinsir both appear in the Safari Zone, but the areas of the highest encounter rate for them is still just 4%. Not only that, but they have a low catch rate, so even if you find them, chances are they're gonna make a run for it before you can catch them. They are available in one other location, however. The Rocky Game Corner. Issue is that they cost 65,000 coins, which if you just buy the coins and not gamble, totals about $130,000 each. No thank you. I decided to first get the Gold Teeth and Surf, and then I went on the hunt in Area 2 for Scyther. This hunt took me a very long time. In the time it took, I found no less than 3 Pinsir, which appear in Area 2 at a 1% encounter rate. I caught the first Pinsir as well as my second ball. 
On one of my ways back to the area with Scyther, I found a Chansey, a 4% encounter rate that I wasn't even looking for. I caught this with my second ball, which honestly just makes me more th mad than anything, because I was going to catch this later. I couldn't for Scyther. You could tell by the timer on the side of my screen just how long this hunt took, or just how long Scyther took in general, but I finally caught it. Please. End my suffering. Please be the one to end the suffering that I have tormented myself with for the past two hours, Scyther. You fucking did it! You fucking did it! You've ended my suffering! Oh my god! Oh, oh, oh we did it! I went back to Cycling Road because I actually forgot to catch Shelter after changing the bike box at the PC, and then went back to Saffron and didn't do anything much, just stop the Mafia from taking over what is probably the Pokemon equivalent of Microsoft or something. No biggie, typical Tuesday shenanigans. While I was there, War Turtle evolved into Blastoise and I got the gift Lapras. I also got the Master Ball, a Pokeball which would be extremely useful as it catches any Pokemon without fail. I don't want it. After taking care of the Mafia, I go back and battle my way through the Fighting Dojo and get a Hitmonchan. Hitmonlee is also here, but you only get one of the two per playthrough, so we'll come back for it. I then go to the Saffron Gym and... Oh boy. I eventually escape the maze and get the Marsh Badge after beating her team, which was oddly not bad considering it has a bunch of level 50 Psychic types, including a fucking Alakazam. The next badge is over in Cinnabar Island, so I flew down to Fuchsia and started surfing there. Along the way, I fished up a Tentacool, fuck, a Staryu, and a Tentacruel. Along the way to Cinnabar, you need to go through the Seafoam Island, so I figured I would catch some Pokemon there. I caught a Krabby, a Dugon, which is a rare spawn, a Seal, creative name there, Golbat, a Kingler, and after solving some simple puzzles, I reached the legendary bird Articuno. I caught it easily, no problem at all. Definitely didn't lose the first time around and have to retry. Thing is, I somehow managed to completely avoid Slowpoke and Slowbro, so I caught the Slowpoke after way too long and decided I'll just evolve it later instead of dealing with a 1% encounter rate. Upon reaching Cinnabar Island, I set a fly point and immediately flew to Pewter City to go back to Mount Moon and catch a Clefairy. I got an old Amber from the museum and I also went down to where I got Flash before and this time traded the extra Clefairy I just caught for a Mr. Mine. Going back to Cinnabar, I restored the fossils to Aerodactyl and Omanyte. The gym is locked and only opens when you get the key in the Pokemon Mansion. The Pokemon Mansion was simple to navigate. I caught Grimer, Raticate, Muck, got the key I needed, but then I decided to bail to buy more Pokeballs. Upon my return, I caught Growlithe and Ditto. Something else I realized as I was going about this area is that my team is lower level than some of the wild Pokemon here, so I knew I was going to have to really need to grind my levels. I hadn't even hit level 40 yet. I went into Cinnabar Gym and flexed my incredible Pokemon knowledge. Caterpie evolves into Butterfree. No, it evolves into Metapod. The game bamboozled me. I thought it meant, like, Caterpie evolves into Butterfree right away, but yes, Caterpie eventually becomes a Butterfree. I was meshing A. I... I always think I have to clear the text box, then I get the choice, sir. I then trounced all the trainers and their Pokemon before taking on Blaine, who was pretty easy because I was stacked with coverage against fire. There is one final gym in the game, the Viridian Gym. Thing is, we also had an area that needed exploring. Going to Route 9 and surfing down brought me to the Power Plant, in which I caught a Magnemite, Voltorb, Magneton, Electrode, and the legendary Zapdos at the end of the plant. After doing this, I beat Giovanni in the Viridian Gym, and not only got the Earth Badge, but also made him disband the entire Mafia. Huh? How? Guess he was just so moved at me using the same attacks numerous times over and over in our battle. Alright, my next objective on this journey is becoming the strongest trainer in the entire region. So I head to the Pokemon League, beating Blue on the way. This fight is where I realized something. Gen 1 is terrible with EXP gaining. I was not going to be ready for the Elite Four once I arrived. I made my way up to Victory Road, catching Poliwhirl along the way, I then had to navigate through Victory Road, and it surprisingly wasn't as difficult as I thought it was going to be, but I did catch Graveler in the cave. I then proceeded to get distracted by playing Mario for 60 hours at the end of 2022, you know, as you do, and from there, I went on the grind. 
Off stream, I grinded the entire team up to level 55. Most of my grinding was at Victory Road, however Charizard needed the experience from Pokemon Mansion, and Pikachu got it from Seafoam Islands, as they're not as good at handling the most common Victory Road Pokemon. After about 9.5 hours of grinding spread across 2 weeks because I had a lot of other things I needed to do such as Wind Waker speedrun practice, Pokemon Violet, school, and not paying taxes, I was ready to take on the Pokemon League. Except first, I had to catch a Moltres, so I went and did that. But now, it was time for the Elite Four, who are actually all really easy. The final fight against Blue, however, did pose some challenges, especially on his Alakazam. It was a bit of a close fight, but in the end, I beat Blue and became the champion of the Kanto region with 97 Pokemon in the Pokedex. So now that we beat the game, what's left? Well, as you can tell, we have a ton of Pokemon we still need to get for the complete Pokedex, and the next destination is Cerulean Cave. Cerulean Cave is filled with many high-level, rare Pokemon. In the cave, I caught Seeking, Gloom, Sandslash, Venomoth, Rhydon, and finally, Lickitung. There are only two random encounter Pokemon left to get in yellow, actually. These final two are Psyduck and Golduck, both found through fishing on Route 6, just north of Vermilion City. There isn't any particular reason these two were last, it's just that I hadn't had a good opportunity really to go back and get them. And I also kind of forgot about them. Between the Psyduck and the Golduck, I actually withdrew one of my Cubone from a PC. In the underground passage connecting Route 5 to Route 6, there's actually a kid who will trade you a Cubone for their Machoke. Not only does this put Machoke in the Pokedex, but the champ as well. I then went to my PC and deposited all of my Pokemon except Pikachu so I can withdraw the Stone Evolution Pokemon, starting with Nidorina and Jigglypuff, who I used my remaining Moonstones to evolve into Nidoqueen and Wigglytuff. I then deposited them and... So what happened was, when I deposited my team, I deposited all but Pikachu. However, Pikachu had fainted in the Cerulean Cave. The game lets you do that and doesn't immediately black you out. As soon as I moved anywhere, however, the game then blacks me out because I have no usable Pokemon. So I guess Glitchless is over, but that's pretty funny. I then flew over to Celadon City and went into the department store to buy the evolutionary stones I needed. In here, I bought two Fire, one Thunder, three Water, and three Leaf Stones. I then head back to my PC and evolved all the stone evolution Pokemon I had. Growlithe into Arcanine, Eevee into Jolteon, Shelter into Cloyster, Weep and Bell into Victory Bell, Execute into Executor, Poliwhirl into Poliwrath, Staryu into Starmie, and Gloom into Vileplume. I then had to make a quick stop at the game corner for one last one, Vulpix. Vulpix is only obtainable through spending a thousand coins in the game corner to buy it. Fifty game corner coins cost a thousand poke dollars, so overall, Vulpix cost twenty thousand dollars. A massive price to pay. But I did and used my Firestone to evolve it into Ninetales. Porygon is another game corner exclusive, but this one costs ten thousand coins instead, which equates to about two hundred thousand dollars. That is a ton of money. So where am I gonna get it? Well, the best way to make money in these games is to fight the Elite Four over and over again. Each round gets you a net profit of about $30,000, assuming you don't buy healing items, so after a few hours of doing it, I eventually had enough. Now was time for what was going to be another big grind. I was at 120 Pokemon and I had 9 Pokemon that needed to evolve through level up. I took out a few of them and started to switch train in Cerulean Cave. There's just one small issue with this. Experience gain in Gen 1 is incredibly slow. To show how bad it is, this Metapod is level 4. I find a Venomoth, switch to Blastoise, and eventually kill it after it stops putting me to sleep. This boosted Metapod to level... 8. After I got my Butterfree, which barely made it to level 10 after one more battle, I decided this would be way too slow. So I instead went over and got the EXP All, which works exactly like how it does in Gen 6 onward. The way it works in Gen 6 onward is that every Pokemon on the team gains experience, so I would just have to use Blastoise in battle, no swapping. Also a little quirk of this item, it was programmed wrong. If two or more Pokemon participate in battle, the total EXP will be split in half between the two of them. What's supposed to happen is that all the other Pokemon should get half of the total experience that's given out to the participating Pokemon. For example, a Pokemon that gives out a thousand experience upon being killed gives all participating Pokemon a cut of 500 experience, and the other 500 is divided equally between the rest of the team. This is bugged, and they instead get half of what each participant gets. So if two Pokemon were in that previously mentioned battle, they would get 250 each, while the rest get 250 spread across all of them. I still knew this grind was going to take a while, so I geared myself up mentally for more grinding. But that's when Twitch chat suggested an idea. I need to play red and blue for version exclusives. 
Why don't I trade Pokemon over to those games and use them as I played through Red and Blue? progressing more through the game and grinding at the same time, while also getting the 1.5 times EXP boost for trading Pokemon. I thought this was a genius idea and went right over to Pokemon Red. Thing is, I wanted the Pokemon to obey me, and the weakest of the Pokemon I currently had would not obey me, so I needed the first badge that a Pokemon up to level 20 would obey. Right before I fought Brock, however, I realized something. I was on Pokemon Red. My plan was to play through one game as a level up grind Pokemon, and then the other game was a speedrun route. The thing is, all glitchless routes for speedruns are designed for Pokemon Red, not Blue. This means that to make it easier for myself later, I would have to restart my game and go back through on Blue. I did that and got my first badge in Blue. I then caught a full team of Pokemon, ready for trade, set up my emulators, and... I have no idea what to do. I tried a few things and looked at sites that were probably older than me, but I couldn't figure it out. I tried for an hour, but I could not get these two games to connect. To this day, I still have no idea how to get two windows of Visual Boy Advance to connect. There's a key to that last sentence, however. On Visual Boy Advance. I downloaded a different emulator, MGBA, and started work on training Pokemon the next day. This one was with its own set of issues, however. I had numerous issues such as the game speeding up and I didn't know how to limit frame rates, the game would desync so one detects the other but the other doesn't detect anything, weird audio issues, and also for some reason I ended up with three different save files for both yellow and blue, so sometimes I would load the wrong ones and I have to load up the correct ones, and I looked at oddities like when I had one file from after my first trades and the other before, were blue loading into a file that I thought wasn't even on my PC anymore. After enough tinkering, we got it to work, trading over the trade evolutions for Gengar, Alakazam, and Golem, as well as the full team of Pokemon that needed grinding. Time to play the game with these Pokemon. What? So as it turns out, Pokemon up to level 20 will obey. Only on Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. In Gen 1, you need to get the second badge before Pokemon obtained third trade above level 10 will obey. So I did more tinkering to get Squirtle back in blue, went through Mount Moon with just Squirtle and Wartortle, picked a Dome Fossil, and beat Misty after hoping my Pokemon would obey because Wartortle fainted. Now my entire team will obey me. I made my way through the game like normal, helping Bill, going on the SS Anne, got cut, beating Surge, and making my way to Rock Tunnel. On the way there, Drowsy and Mankey evolved into Hypno and Primeape respectively, who I traded over to Red and got Ponyta in return. Rock Tunnel. Oh boy, this one. As you would expect, this place is filled with Rock types and trainers with Rock types. This is where problems arise. Looking at my team, I have two Flying types, a Fire type, a Cut user, a Dragonair with only normal and electric moves, and a Slowpoke. Slowpoke was the only one I could take on Rock types, and not only did it not fully obey me because Lieutenant Surge didn't boost the level cap, it seems only every second gym does that, but Slowpoke fainted halfway through, leaving the rest to take on Geodudes, Onyx, and Gravelers. It took forever, but I finally made it out. I then went over to Celadon City, picked up an Eevee, and evolved it into the most breedable Pokemon. I then took on the Rocket Hideout, beat Erika to raise my level cap up to 50, with Dodua evolving into Dodrio at the end of the battle, and then got the Poke Flute after going up Lavender Tower. From here, I got past Norlax and went to Fuchsia City. I then decided to fly back to Celadon now that I had the Fly Point and fished up a Poliwhirl catch. With this, I was able to trade in Cerulean City for a Jinx. I also took a quick stop to Saffron to get Hitmonlee from the Fighting Dojo, and now back to the Safari Zone. Yes, we are back in this hell. Except this time, it isn't that bad, as no Pokemon need to be caught. I got lost once and ran out of steps, caught a Chansey while testing my luck on the first ball, ran out of steps again in front of the door, and then finally got Surf. We still needed to beat Koga, so I did that real quick. After beating Koga, I went to Cinnabar Island, revived Kabuto, evolved Slowpoke into Slowbro, and caught Magmar in the Pokemon Mansion. Now we have the worst part. Grinding. Ponyta needed to be level 40 and Dragonair needed to be level 55. I flew around the region and collected all 10 rare candies I could. I decided to grind in the Pokemon Mansion and once I finished getting Dragonair to level 45, I dumped all the candies on it to get Dragonite. I then grinded Ponyta up to level 40 and got Rapidash. After doing my trades, I got all of my evolved Pokemon into Yellow, as well as Meowth and Kabuta. To train these two up, I decided I would fight the Elite Four over and over again, using the EXP all to grind the others. Of course, since the EXP is divided among all party members, optimally I needed to solo the league with only one Pokemon. After some quick thinking, I decided that Nidoking was the best fit due to the coverage and high stats. 
Snorlax was considered, but it had a bad special stat in these games, which affects basically all of its moves. Nidoking is slightly better on special and is also good on physical. Here is where the issue arises. I'm broke, so I can't buy items. You might see my high levels, especially after I dump my rare candies all on Nidoking and wonder how that's an issue. Let me introduce you all to Lorelei. All of her Pokémon have either an ice or a water attack that can deal extremely large chunks of damage to me, as well as the fact that none of them reliably go down in one hit. This fight was a slaughter each and every time. I rarely made it past. Even when I did make it past, I would lose to Lance. At least my Pokémon still gained experience even when I lost to Lorelei, as long as I defeat at least one Pokémon. Oh yeah, something else I learned. If a Pokémon reaches evolution level and you lose, it won't evolve. To get my Kabuto to evolve, it had to level up and I had to win, which was a little annoying. After a bit though, I got Persian and Kabutops. Now there is only one game left, Pokémon Red. Once again, I need to place her up to Koga and Surf, so I decided for this game I would use a speedrun route to get there and then go back for the Pokémon he needs to catch. I was originally going to use an RNG manipulation to get the Nidoran I needed, but I decided against it. For those who don't know, RNG manipulation is basically playing the game from a hard reset up to a certain point doing precise inputs to guarantee an outcome. In this case, it would be finding a Nidoran with good stats. But I realized that I could maybe finish this playthrough in under 50 hours, and learning a manip would take too long. I grabbed the Anti-Pretend Glitchless Classic route, which bans RNG manipulation through a hard reset, and it also says any Nidoran worked. Despite this, it showed some info on DV manipulation based on the last encounter you got or something. I didn't bother trying to understand it and just called it level 4 Nidoran. The strategy was simple for the whole playthrough. Swap train Nidoran until after Brock, who I definitely didn't lose to, and then solo with Nidoran for the rest of the game. I went through Mount Moon, talked to Bill, beat Misty, got Cut, beat Surge, made my way to Celadon, got Fly, which is super important, finished the Rocket Hideout, climbed the Pokemon Tower, cleared Sylph, which was unnecessary for us, but the route didn't and I just did it for the XP. I wish there was an in-game reward for clearing Sylph, especially if it made catching Pokemon easier. I then got Surf and beat Koga, and this entire process I just described was done in just about 2 hours, which is crazy. Now let's catch the rest of the guys. In Viridian Forest, I caught Weedle and Kakuna, Route 4 had Ekans, I got Eevee from Celadon City, Pikachu and Electabuzz in the Power Plant, Coughing and Weezing in the Pokemon Mansion, and the Omanyte I got from my Helix Fossil. I quickly evolved Eevee and Pikachu into Flareon on Raichu respectively, and traded them to Yellow. Now was the final stretch of the grind. Just 3 Pokemon needed evolving. Kakuna, Ekans, and Omanyte. Kakuna didn't take that long, but I had to actually win Lorelei for it to evolve. Ekans evolved shortly after, and Omanyte was quick thereafter. It's worth noting that I traded Omanyte from red instead of just using the one I already had in yellow, because that would give me the EXP boost and make the grind a little quicker. This brought our total up to 150 Pokemon, which is every Pokemon in the game that you can get without glitches. So our journey is done? Well, no. That counter included Mew, so there was one more Pokemon that I needed, Mewtwo. I saved Mewtwo for last specifically because I thought it would be a good climactic finish to the playthrough. To make it better, I walked through Cerulean Cave, the final victory walk up to the strongest Pokemon in the game. I then accidentally dug out when trying to use Surf, so that ruined the victory walk. Mewtwo, as you would expect, is very tough. It has Psychic as an attack, and considering a third of my team is Poison type, it can one-shot them as well as basically any of my Pokemon. After a few Great Balls, however, I got lucky and caught it. With that, 151 Pokemon in the decks, it is done. After speaking to the game director in Celadon City, we get the diploma for completing the Pokedex with a final time of 46 hours, 52 minutes, and 42 seconds. So that's it. All 151 Pokemon are easily obtainable within 50 hours. This was a lot of fun, and overall it wasn't too difficult either. The other people in the Game Freak office comment about you completing your Pokédex, and one guy even says that you could print it out with the Game Boy printer, only in yellow. This is what it would look like when printed out. I'd say literally anyone could get the Pokédex done in the amount of time I did, or even less. I had very little planning, optimizations, and I was a little bit leisurely with playing the game because at the end of the day, it was still a casual playthrough. It's been a few years since I played, so I just wanted to take my time. If you want to know just how fast you can complete the Pokédex with full optimization, you have a few answers to that. Red and Blue have a catch em all category where you use one save of blue and come the end, you enter the Hall of Fame with 151 Pokemon in your Pokedex. As of this video, the record sits at 1 hour 28 minutes and 43 seconds by Grogear, which sounds insane and it absolutely is. 
However, this run is incredibly broken, using insane glitches such as LG and item underflow to do crazy stuff like what I showed at the beginning and what you're seeing right now. I highly recommend checking out the awesome games done quick run from 2021 of the category done by Etiquette. The run is explained there by the runner and commentators, and it's also just very fun to watch it all unfold. If you want something without glitches, there are two categories of 124 glitchless, which is getting every Pokemon obtainable in one save of one game. Each one follows different rule sets on defining what is a glitch, specifically instant text from talking to the bike shop guy without a voucher, and using a Pokedoll to skip the Marowak and Silph scope in the Lavender Tower. The final times of these runs come at the 5 hours 50 minutes and 51 seconds and 6 hours 29 minutes and 56 seconds, both held by shenanigans. As for completing the full Pokedex without glitches, there are a few other runs you can look at. There's the red, blue, and yellow catch em all glitchless run, where runners Dark Coco, Restla, and Cruel played one game each and finished with a complete dex of 150 Pokemon in each with a time of 9 hours, 49 minutes, and 48 seconds. There's a run of a similar nature where Surreal Guy and Trebian did it with just red and blue in 7 hours, 8 minutes, and 6 seconds. The final one I want to mention is the red and green one player run where runner Zunao played both games at the same time and finished the Pokedex in green with a time of 5 hours, 31 minutes, and 15 seconds. A link to all of these runs mentioned will be in the description. Personally, I think this kind of run would be a lot of fun to do at some point. The issue is that I don't really have anyone to do it with, and also setting something up like that would be a pain in the ass to do. So let's rank this Pokedex in terms of difficulty, length, and if I would recommend doing it like I set out to do from the start. So in terms of length, this is currently the longest Pokedex I've done in this series but it's also the shortest. The difficulty isn't that bad. Sure, you have to play all three games if you're using yellow like I did, but there are no annoying mechanics that are required to get Pokemon. No cool gameplay features needed. You just run around in grass and catch the Pokemon you don't have, which I guess is boring, but you're also playing a game where you just press the A button a bunch and win most fights, so it's not terrible. In the end, I would definitely give this one a recommendation to fans of the games to try. If you want to see these runs done live, I'll be starting Generation 2 and trying to complete the Crystal decks within a few days of this video going live, so you can find that on my Twitch channel linked below. That's all I really have to say. Smell you later or something.